Uh, we'll talk today about our efforts to restore the cultural landscape and how it impacts our visitor experience. Palo Alto Battlefield is the only national park that is dedicated to uh, preserving and interpreting sites uh, associated with the U.S.-Mexican War, 1846-1848. Right now we have uh, Palo Alto Battlefield and Resaca de la Palma Battlefield, and there is legislation in Congress to uh, expand our boundary to include the earthen ruins of Fort Brown. <clears throat> Excuse me. What started on these fields in the Rio Grande Delta would lead to events that would forever change the face of the North American continent and forge the relationship between these two young republics, with Mexico ceding over half of its national territory to the United States. So this is undeniably significant to both of our countries, and it's part of our history that isn't, especially in the United States, isn't well remembered or well understood. So it is a porn site. That's about all the history I'm gonna give right now. So please come visit the park, come visit Brownsville and the battlefield. I'll, uh, I promise you a personal tour of the site if y'all come down, okay? I'll, you can call me on that. <clears throat> so, we know how the battle unfolded. We know the Salt Prairie, we have historic records. The enabling legislation of 1992 uh, gave us a 3,400 acre boundary and we know it's on the Salt Prairie. It took, it took a lot of archeology span to determine where the core battlefield was, uh, but between 92 and 2000, we really didn't own any property. So we spent a lot of time researching, which was very nice, because we have a good, good foundation. But if you see this picture, uh, it's probably one of the most, of uh, period lithographs, it's probably one of the most accurate depiction of what it looked like at one of the battlefields. Most of them are really stylized and don't really cover, don't really represent. Of course, you gotta take away the mounds because if you come to Brownsville, there's gonna be no mounds there. <laughs> but, you know, this war really ushered out the Napoleonic era of warfare. And you had two big armies sitting on the salt prairie lined up against each other with the Mexican army still wearing their shakos and their dress uniform with bright blues and bright reds while the U.S. Army was a little more f in fatigues, but they were still lined up, still kind of following the tactics. Uh, but they had some major innovations, especially with artillery and flying artillery. I said I wasn't gonna talk about history anymore, but I'll, I'll just continue on. Uh, <laughs> now the Battle of Palo Alto is largely unchanged uh, from 1846 because it's sitting at the edge of the coastal prairie and it wasn't good for, for crop cultivation or, and marginal for livestock grazing. That said, 20th century cultural activities have impacted the cultural landscape and the setting. In the 92 legislation, the Congress charges the park to, uh, to restore and maintain the historic character of the site, cultural landscape, right? Uh, we have a problem what, starting at the beginning of the 20th century, about 1910, Cameron County, Hidalgo County, and Willisie County, all the region in South Texas on the U.S. side, started huge drainage projects in a reaction to the hurricane of 1898 and all the large-scale flooding that lasted for months down there. So we have this, so the hydrology's really changed, and then you add the damming of the Rio Grande River, the Rio Grande Delta does not flood like it used to, and the coastal prairie, the salt prairie, which can take water on it for months, does not flood, which has allowed native woody vegetation to encroach upon the battlefield. Then you bring uh, mid 20th century land management activities directly um, related to that. I'll go through a series of maps here. In 1939, you don't have a lot of activity out on the battlefield, but it's these, these land clearing and attempts at crop cultivation and cattle grazing, which has really impacted the, the, the cultural landscape or the natural vegetation, the natural vegetation communities out there. It was 1939, still open. 
1950, we began to see bigger scars. That's a gas pipeline running through, but it's still kind of a wide open prairie. Then comes the second half of the 20th century, 1962, um, you get roads in, you get these cultural lines. Oh, here's a, let me use this. You get this, these cultural lines in the salt prairie up there, these, where they've removed vegetation. You see even more all the way up there. All the, these are all cultural lines in that impact. And you get this big field up in here, um, which is outside the core battlefield. So we reforced that and let that go. And then you can even see more. They're just continue. The more latter part of the 20th century really impacted um, the battlefield by removing the salt prairie. This prairie, and it's in... Um, in the historic counts, Ulysses Grant talks about the grass there as being, comparing it to darning needles and piercing your skin. If you walk out in gulf cord grass, it does. I have never had a pair of pants that it won't go through. Um, and so that's what we're dealing with. You see these lines right here that come in in the 1970s and they're there, they're still there today. And that's because cord grass on its own does not fill in, it doesn't migrate, it grows in clumps, it's not in rhizomes. So that's one of our biggest challenges in restoring the cultural setting, being accurate, but also we need the cord grass for fire, which is gonna be the most efficient management tool we have. Until this day, y'all see that or is there a lot of light on that? Y'all see the mats pretty good? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is the modern day map, this is showing what we own and what we don't own. And so since this is a private inholding holding still, we're only concentrating on this part of the core battlefield. We've done, a, we've done intensive archeology, span so we know where the, where the core battlefield stops. And so everything over here west, we're just gonna leave nature take its course. Let it fill in with brush. It will act as a buffer for us, for the sound, for the highway right here, for this highway. It won't, we won't be able to see it, and we'll cut down some of the sound. And then it will also serve as a habitat for cats and the ocelot. We do have an ocelot. We don't have a big enough area to have a breeding population, but we have had some transitory ocelots come through. But bobcats, coyote, that other, that other habitat is going to be valuable for that. Meanwhile, we'll concentrate on preserving and restoring the cultural landscape on the core battlefield up there. Um... Like uh, they said earlier, it takes a village. I'm the only resource person in the park. And so I depend on partnerships. And as you see here, I really rely. Uh, thanks to uh, Joel Wagner, who is a hydrologist uh, with a water resources division in Fort Collins, his persistence and keeping a partnership. This uh, project here is called the Rosaka Restoration and Adjacent Coastland Prairie. Uh, it partners with uh, Colorado State University, David Cooper, he's a wetland ecologist, and USDA NRCS Plant Material Center Director uh, John Lloyd Riley. And without these help, we are, I mean, we're making ground. We're trying to discover the most efficient way to reintroduce cord grass, because uh, like I said, it's accurate, but it's gonna give us the tool to keep woody vegetation at bay. Uh, without having to, without having to progressively, but also the started with the Rosaka restoration, which is right in there. And in the 1950s, um, let's see, here's a map of the area. In the 1950s, during a major drought, they put uh, these two livestock tanks and they drug ditches on the inner side of the the Rosaka here and throwing the spoil pile on the outside, uh, making these artificial levees so the Rosaka wouldn't function naturally like it did, and then plus impacting the cultural landscape by changing it. This Rosaka during the battle, and here I go talking about history again, during the battle, the Mexican cavalry was trying to outflank the American on the west, and they crossed this twice. It slowed them down because they didn't, they didn't really see it. It just looked like ground, but then it would, they had water bodies in it and it slowed them down and allowed the American artillery to position itself and, and repel them from there. Uh, we also did, before we did any ground moving, we did some backhoe trenching in there just to see where the, the historic natural ground level, the, the historic levee was, compared with the spoil pile. 
And in this, we also determined that this Rasaka, how many of y'all know what a Rasaka is? That's a pretty good amount. A Rasaka is an abandoned channel, main channel, or distributory channel of the Rio Grande Delta system. So we determined, based upon the science, that it, this was abandoned about 500 years ago. And naturally what happens, as you see through some of those aerials, they fill in. They only hold water in times of tropical storms or heavy rain. So this is what it looks like. I can't, I can't see these great, I, can't, I see it better on my computer top. But these are the artificial levees berms. This is the Rosaka back here. And this is a tank right there. And then these are the berms that stop. We pushed all that in. And now we have an even flow where the, where the broad prairie flows, sheet flows into the Rosaka basin like it, like it should be doing naturally. While we're doing, this is the result, and now native vegetation has come back on here. Uh, but also, we have a problem. Like I said, woody vegetation, cattle grazing has allowed woody vegetation, and then the change in hydrology to encroach upon the battlefield. And this is where, you know, it was bare earth. We had cattle here. Came up, it should look like this, where there hadn't been removed all the vegetation. This is cord grass. This is that private end holding right there. This is the fence. This is all good cord grass prairie. And that's what it should look like. If you notice, there are a few trees out there, uh, but that's natural. It's the area that's been highly disturbed where mesquite and wasacha will rush in and invade. All those other trees were about 20 years old. I'll show another picture of them right now. In 2016, uh, we partnered with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We're going to mechanically reduce the brush on the prairie. Uh, we got a big uh, roller chopper. The, oh, here well, we put in about the park put in about twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. Fish and Wildlife matched that with about forty-five thousand dollars. And the reason they're interested in restoring the prairie on Palo Alto is because the Oplomato falcon. An endangered species that's recovering, and this is in the heart of their territory right there. And so they, they're willing to, they have a, it's a Fish and Wildlife Coastal Program out of Corpus, and, you know, they benefit. We have a breeding pair of ophthalmodos on the eastern part of the park. But we had a big roller chopper machine, and we were able to clear all the brush in that one area. It leaves it down like this, where actually you drive with little buggies or carts that we have, UTVs, without having to worry about um, puncturing tires or anything like that. And that's cord grass right there where it's in. We had areas that once looked like this. You see that gas sign, natural gas pipeline sign? Now look like that. So, what happens? We clear, we do the mechanical, mechanical treatment at first. Next spring, you get all these young sprouts coming out, so we got to herbicide treat them. Uh, we do the basal bark, which is training. Basal bark, you get a concentration of uh, vegetable oil, about 75% to 25% Garlon 4, and you just coat the first about from the knee high down, get a good coating around, and it's about 90% effective. The next spring, not the 10% of the trees will come back. But also, while we're doing this, because this is the area, a lot of the area where we're doing this uh, is without cord grass. There's a large part of the core battlefield where the cord grass was totally removed. There are some areas that still have it. Um, so we're working on reintroducing Gulf cord grass. Like I said, we're working on trying to find the most efficient way to, re to reintroduce it. Uh, the tried and true way is getting grass plugs, splitting them, and then growing them in containers and putting them out. We've also been working on gathering seeds. We've been gathering seeds from uh, the Fish and Wildlife uh, Bahia Grande unit, which they do fires regularly, and we find out those seeds have a much higher germination rate because they've been the grasses were burned the year before, and so when they come back in the spring, the seeds, the seeds are much more early produced because they've been in shock. And so we collect those. We actually take them up to USDA. They process the seeds, and we send them up to a vegetable grower in San Antonio, and we get nice little plugs like that. And then we plant them in there. This was planting back in 2016, maybe, this one. And uh, this is what it looks like. There was no cord grass out here at all. 
after three years, it's, it's coming back. It looks nice. It looks much better in person, believe me. And then this was just last week. So we're moving on. We're getting proud. This year, we'll be planting about fifty to 60,000 plugs. But what's really exciting about this year, we're finally doing seeding experiments, our different experiments in there. We're seeding. You see all those flags? Those all little plots. This is one we were, we were supposed to get these clumps of cord grass, then put them through like a bale buster. But because of the dirt, that really wasn't working right. So we decided to use this method and kind of dig a little trench, put them in there and do that. But we're also doing uh, seeding experiments. And that looks like a big bag of seeds, right? The seeds are real small. So we have to kind of mix it with uh, cornmeal and husk from husk from seeds and all that. That way, because it's, I mean, the seeds are real small and we, do, we want to spread them out evenly throughout the plot, so we have to have filler with it. And so we're doing it by hand. First, we do it by hand, just kind of strictly on the ground in different plots. Uh, and then we're using a, a, a seed drill to put them in. This is what it looks like, kind of some weird instrument, kind of, uh, I don't know what from. Uh, but it's pretty cool that, and then we have like watered some plots or watered some aren't, you know, it's half and half. It's, it's all uh, these guys, John Lord Riley and David Cooper kind of decide to design this experiment. It wasn't me, I'm only an archeologist. So <laughs> anyway, this is the tool. We, we need to do all this, we need to get cord grass, but this is the tool that's gonna efficiently keep the woody vegetation at bay because we'll never be able to bring back the hydrology. The other thing about the cord grass, when it's dense, we, after heavy rains, tropical storms, it will hold the water up near the surface a lot longer. We did experiments uh, at the very beginning with, uh, with uh, little sensors that test the hydrology in the ground. And the plots that had dense cord grass, the water would stay at the soil, at the ground surface a lot longer, which also would help to keep the, the plants at bay. But the fire is really going to be the main tool for us. So that way when visitors come uh, to see the park, they can experience like the soldiers saw it, but also be able to envision a wide open prairie and imagine two 19th century armies facing up, which really helps us to, to, uh, to interpret the battlefield. And thank you for your attention.